All right, so the hot topic right now is Gen AI, but we've been helping customers with a number of use cases around AI from customer churn, fraud detection, personalization. Help me understand the difference between Gen AI and AI. Yeah, absolutely. So, of course, everybody's noticed AI because it's all of a sudden it's magical and it's in the public consciousness. But it goes back, I mean, quite a ways. Um, the way that I would differentiate it, generative AI is something that uh, are the models, the large language models that are creating new things, right? So we're using it to generate images or poems or um, in the case of um, automation and as automated assistance, we might be helping to generate code, right? So those are, those are taking a, a prompt, an input, and bringing out new output. Whereas what, I would, what we would classify as analytical AI are those use cases that you cited a moment ago, right? Which is where you're classifying something or trying to group it or trying to predict things. But they're also, they're more specific tuned models to those use cases, whereas the generative AI models tend to be by default, fairly generic, trained on a very wide variety of information on the internet. Got it. I mean, but it, it sounds like when we're talking about analytical AI, those are very specific to like the business use case, right? Yeah, quite often. What are the business use cases of generative AI? Because I'm mostly just thinking about ChatGPT, where it's, you know, you ask it a question and it generates an answer for you, like a person's responding to you. But I'm struggling to see the business use cases. So let me start with talking about AI in general, and then we'll, we'll come back to generative AI. So if you look at the way AI has been applied in, in the past, it's very it's pointed solutions. So if we look at um, the, the case of, like you mentioned fraud detection earlier, fraud detection, it happens enough that Amazon's built a service around that. So we have AWS services specific to fraud detection, to text-to-speech, to speech-to-text. Those are all technically um, forms of artificial intelligence or machine learning. So those, those are common enough services and they happen in a standard enough way that they've been packaged up and AWS is offering us services. Um, in addition, when you get into company-specific data, company-specific problems around fraud, so MasterCard, Visa, American Express are very interested in fraud detection. Um, not only are they interested in it from preventing it, but they also don't want to prevent your transaction that's not fraudulent from, um, from being declined unnecessarily, right? And so they've got very specific models that, that have their own proprietary information in it. Now, as we transition to generative AI, that sort of changes the game because the, the large language models that have been trained to date have been trained on uh, the public internet effectively, right? So the, the upshot of that is that they're very generalized across um, all the corpus of human information that's out on the internet, and they're less specific to a particular business's use case. The danger there is that there's not a differentiator for you as a company using a large, large language model out of the box. Like anybody else, if, they, if you built your business case on using generative AI in that way, there's no competitive moat that protects you from your competitors. Whereas, to your point, how should customers be using generative AI internally? The, the key use cases we see today are to accelerate internal use cases. So some forms of content creation, in some cases marketing that doesn't need to be super specified to, um, to the company, in some cases generating form letters or, or summarizing data. Um, those are use cases that, are, that we're using as well. But um, another key uh, approach that we're seeing is, is to use what's called retrieval augmented generation with generative AI, and that's adding a company's proprietary information, ideally privately, combining that with the, these models and, and getting a, a natural language response. So the models can do summarization very well. They can um, look at um, sort of knowledge bases that are internal to the customer and accelerate, say, a customer service representative or maybe a, uh, maybe a sales or an account executive that's working on what's a great way to respond to a an RFP for a customer, um, use the internal corpus of company data to help generate that response. It's very specific still to the internal company, but leverages the, the language capabilities that the large language models have been trained on. Got it. So, I mean, generally the, the outcome of using some of this, these generative AI models is to gain efficiencies and... Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> There's no question about that. Um, I think I think the key to think about too is like we, we do need a little like to really create a competitive differentiator. A little bit of effort needs to be put in to, to train the model and to tune the model to the specifics, but not to retrain the entire model. You're not going to retrain any of these large language models on a on a normal company's budget. So um, at like mixing in and, and using the optimal amount of, of tweaking and tuning or prompting in, in these cases is where we see customers having good success. And ideally it looks like magic. We're not at the point where what, what, what might be termed 
artificial general intelligence or the kinds of things like you see in Skynet or in the movies where the, the AI becomes sentient. The gener generative AI is conversational, but it's not sentient. It doesn't have intent. It just knows the data that it's been fed into its model. And so we can, we can use that to our advantage, le leverage its ability to understand and produce language and outputs combined with company data to, to really get a, a tuned response for, well, for business use cases. I do know that AWS has um, a host of AI services mm -hmm. from forecast to Textract to transcribe to Lex, Poly, Pinpoint, there's probably more than what I've named, but. Your memory's better than mine. <laughs> How do those play into generative AI? So they don't, but the, the ability of, of AWS to build services that accelerate developer experiences, they're, they're taking that product, sort of that product approach and that working backwards from the customer approach and they're applying it to a couple of things. The, the keys here for generative AI today are SageMaker Jumpstart and AWS Bedrock. And both of those are model hosting options that you can use to take advantage of third party models that have already been trained across this huge amount of data so that you can consume those as a service and that you can use those in a way that that you know your data isn't being used to retrain the model so that you can use it privately for, for competitive differentiators for your own internal company use cases. Got it. So like if we're thinking about the AI services that AWS has that were listed before, that's more of the analytical AI side of the house. Precisely. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Well, now I know a little bit more about the difference between AI and Gen AI. <laughs>